Colorado in the United States. He's also the executive director of the IASLC, um, though that ends after this session, after this uh, uh, world conference, though. Um, and uh, we're bringing up our panelists. And uh, Dr. Bunn, do you want to introduce them, or do you want me to? Okay, um, so our, our panelists, our first uh, discussant is going to be uh, Dr. Ching Zhao from Guangzhou, China. Um, she's going to be, she's a medical oncologist from the Guangdong Lung Cancer Institute. Uh, we have Dr. Robert Rintoul, respiratory physician and professor at the Papworth Hospital in Cambridge in the UK. Greg Masters, a medical oncologist at the Helen Graham Cancer Center in Delaware in the United States and uh, Professor Sharish Gajil of the Carmonas Cancer Institute, Michigan in the United States. So, Dr. Bunn. So, as mentioned uh, earlier, uh, a large number of people uh, present with lung cancer, and uh, once they present with lung cancer, of course, we want to improve their outcome. And so the goal of therapy is to make patients live longer and live better. And in our clinical trials, of course, we want to measure not only the quantity of their life, but also the quality of their life. We have three major ways of improving uh, the outcome. The first is surgery, and uh, we have many thoracic surgeons in our society, and surgi surgery is here to stay and is the major modality associated with curing patients. Uh, one of the issues for today is would surgery have a role in making patients live better as long as, as well as living longer? Then we have radiation therapy, and uh, radiation therapy uh, is it comes from uh, a machine, and there have been many advances in the technology, uh, and we're going to hear some uh, discussion of the role of radiation in thoracic cancers. And uh, finally, we have drug treatments. and. Uh, in the past, our drug treatments were the same for everybody, and they had considerable toxicity, so in terms of making people live longer, there was some offset of making people not live better. And so it's uh, well established uh, now that uh, if you could select patients for specific treatments, their outcome uh, might be improved. And uh, we'll be hearing some systemic uh, therapy treatments with and without uh, biomarkers. Uh, and um, when we finish, we can have a, perhaps a discussion about individualized uh, therapy. So we're going to be hearing uh, in the session about all those forms of therapy, surgery, radiation, and uh, drug treatments. Perhaps uh, not mentioned as much, but a, a hot topic at the conference, of course, is what we call immunotherapy. But most of the interventions that we're using for immunotherapy are actually what we would consider drugs. Uh, and so that could be considered under the uh, umbrella of uh, systemic uh, drug therapy as well. So I don't want to take the time away from uh, the panelists. And so the first uh, study, and I should also mention that uh, this is an international society, and besides having different specialties here, we're going to have different nations uh, represented here. And part of that uh, reason for having these meetings is so that we would communicate internationally uh, and advance in one area of the world would be advance in another. So uh, the first speaker, Dr. Zhao from uh, China, will be talking about a Chinese clinical trial called Tong 0806 a trial that compared pemetrexid, a standard cytotoxic drug, to gefitinib, which is a drug that is meant for a specific target. Uh, in this interesting study, uh, however, the major point is what would happen in the patients that uh, don't have activation of this target, which is the majority of patients. So without further ado. Thank you, Professor Bond, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, on behalf of uh, Chinese thoracic oncology group, uh, I will report the final result of c 0806 tomorrow morning, and now I will introduce the study briefly. Uh, this study is a phase two trial multicenter conducted in Chinese, and uh, th in this trial, we compared pemetrexid and gefitinib, a second-line sighting, 
for advanced non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer with wild type EGFR mutation. As we know, EGFR mutation is a most important biomarker in first line setting for guideline treatment choice. But however, in second line setting, the role of EGFR mutation is not very clear. So we designed this study. This is a study design. We enrolled local advanced or metastatic non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer and all the patients received standard double, double chemotherapy before enrolling the, the trial. Most importantly, all the patients carry wild type EGFR mutation tumor and detested by direct sequencing. After randomization, one group received pemetrexate and one group received gefitinib. The primary endpoint is PFS. According to the statistical hypothesis, the sample size should be 150. Now we can see the primary endpoint PFS was met, both e evaluated by investigators and also confirmed by independent review committee. We can see in pemetrexate arm, the PFS is 4.8 months, and in gefitinib arm, the PFS is only 1.6 months. The PFS value is less than 0 0.001, and high ratio is 0 0.54. And also the result is confirmed by IRC. The sec about secondary point, uh, end point, in pemetrexate arm, four months and six months PFS rate and the disease control rate were well, much better than that in gefitinib arm. Uh, in terms of OS, we got a margin p-value. However, the objective response rate uh, in the two arms all around 13% without <coughs> significant difference. Pemetrexin um, had, had more uh, ALT increment, fatigue and anemia, and in Pemetrexin um, had more diarrhea and rash. Uh, in terms of grade three or four uh, side effects, we can see Pemetrexin um, had more non-hematological side effects, and totally uh, Pemetrexin um, had more grade three or four side effects. Uh, when the study is nearly closed, we did a very interesting exploration about the abundance of EGR mutation. In, in this exploration, when the patient, if the patient had enough t a tumor tissue uh, for EGR mutation test again, we tested the EGR mutation status by arms again. So in, in, in 108 patients um, who have enough tumor tissue, we tested the EGR mutation again by arms. We found in the 108 patients, we found 32 patients, they are EGR mutation positive. And this EGR mutation included uh, not only extra 19, extra 21 active mutation, also included uh, extra 20 insertion and T790M. And also seven, uh, 76 patients were confirmed by arms to be EGR for wild type. So from the picture we can see in all patients te uh, tested by direct sequencing, the overall response rate in two arms were both around 13%. But in EGF mutation positive patient, the uh, response rate in GFTN arm increased to uh, nearly 20, 40%. But in uh, EGF wild type confirmed by arms, the response rate in GFTN arm reduced to 2.4%. Uh, percent. So uh, we just did a very similar research uh, about abundance EGR mutation uh, published uh, two years ago in JCO. Uh, in that uh, research, we also found if a, if a tumor is EGR for wild type tested by direct sequencing but positive by arms, we consider the tumor contained low abundance EGR mutation. And uh, uh, in this part, low abundance EGR mutation low abundance ear mutation, the patient also can get some benefit from EGRTK, but the benefit is lower than high abundance EGR mutation. So concluding, the, the CTON 0806 is the first trial to show a significant improvement in PFS disease control rate and a trend of improved OS with pemetrexam compared with gefitinib in second line setting in EGFR wild type non squamous non squamous cell lung cancer population. So in second line setting, we can see EGR mutation status should be determined to gather the treatment choice. And ARMS is better than direct sequencing in finding exact population who can get benefit from EGFR TKI treatment. In second line setting for EGFR wild type population, non squamous 
non-small cell lung cancer, the pemetrexide should be recommended. Thank you for your attention. The uh, next uh, presentation will be uh, a discussion of a trial called MESOVATS, which is a pleurectomy uh, versus uh, 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 a, uh, a talc pleuridesis uh, in uh, patients with uh, pleural mesothelioma. Good afternoon, thank you very much for the introduction. So what I'm going to tell you about in the next few minutes is a study that we've run in the UK over the last 10 years or so about mesothelioma. And here's the title, it's a randomized controlled trial. And as, as Dr. Bunn has said, it compares a video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, which is a type of keyhole surgery in the chest, uh, where we, by we remove some of the lining of the lung called partial pleurectomy compared with talc pleuridesis in patients with confirmed or suspected malignant mesothelioma. And I'm presenting this on behalf of the MesoVATS investigators, and it was funded by the Bupa Foundation within the UK. So um, we've heard a lot about various aspects of lung cancer in the last hour and a half. Uh, this is sli slightly different. The malignant mesothelioma is a <coughs> cancer which affects the lining layers of the lung, and it's caused by asbestos dust. Uh, to give you, to set it in a little bit of context for um, those of you who may not know so much about it, there are about 2,000 uh, new cases in the UK each year. There are about 2,000 new cases in, or two to 3,000 new cases in the US each year, and about 900 cases, I think, a year in Australia. There's no known cure for this disease. Uh, it's a very nasty, aggressive type of cancer, and the average survival is around about 9 to 12 months. And on the diagram on the top right, you can see the two uh, linings around the lung, um, the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura, which is actually where the cancer develops in the first place, and this little space in between. And what often happens is that when the cancer develops here in the lining of the lung in red, it causes fluid buildup around the lung here, and that causes the lung to collapse down, so the patient <coughs> becomes more and more breathless. Now, traditionally, what people have done is to put a tube in here, or look in here with a camera, remove all this fluid, let the lung re-expand again, and then put in talc around here to try and stick, in effect, the outside of the lung to the inside of the chest wall. That's what a talc pleurodesis is, and that's what's been done historically. Now, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the VATS, the video-assisted thoracoscopic partial pleurectomy, this keyhole surgery in the chest. Um, these are figures uh, from David Rice, which rather elegantly show um, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, illustrated in white the tumor around the out inside of the chest wall and the outside of the lung. And what the surgeon does is looks into the chest, into the space around the lung, and removes as much of the tumor as possible from the outside. pleurectomy rather than a total pleurectomy. Now, um, the background to this study is that um, previous work, non-randomized trials, um, suggested that actually patients who would had some form of partial pleurectomy might have prolonged survival compared with patients have had, having talc. And we actually wanted to address this in a proper, robust, randomized controlled trial. So what we did was we uh, set the primary objective um, for the talc group and the um, pleurectomy group as survival at one year after patients have been put into the study. And the secondary objectives were looking at quality of life, which is extremely important in this cohort of patients. So if you imagine these people are going to live for about a year. This is not a curative treatment, so quality of life is very important. We also looked at the control of the pleural effusion at various time points and also complications. So uh, before we started the study, we planned to recruit 196 patients uh, based on power calculations, which is exactly what we did. 
and patients could go into the study if they had confirmed mesothelioma, because biopsies had been taken confirming the disease, or if um, patients were suspected of having the disease. They'd presented with fluid around their chest, <coughs> they'd previously had exposure to asbestos, and the working diagnosis, as it were, was that they had mesothelioma. And uh, 76 patients in that group went in. Now, in fact, um, of those 76, 21 turned out not to have mesothelioma at the end of the day, uh, and that left us with 175 people with a confirmed diagnosis of mesothelioma. And as you can see, they were split, fed pretty equally into the talc arm and the, or the, the VAT surgery arm, and most of them in each group received the intended treatment. A few dropped out for various reasons. They withdrew consent or they became ill for other reasons. And although I'm not going to show it to you today, uh, we had a lot of baseline data on both groups, and the two groups were extremely well matched for all their baseline characteristics. Um, their average age was about 69 years. Um, there were more men than women, but that's uh, common with um, mesothelioma. Um, and they were based, when it came to how advanced the disease was, uh, these are patients with a fairly advanced disease, and again, they were well matched between the two groups. So, the findings, what did we discover? Well, in fact, there was no difference in overall survival between the two arms, but, importantly, although they were secondary outcome measures, in the VATS partial pleurectomy arm, there was significantly improved control of the buildup of fluid around the lung, the pleural effusion, compared with the talc arm. And also, patients in the VATS arm, the surgical arm, reported significantly better quality of life up to one year than those in the talc arm, which, as I say, is important for this group of patients. There were more complications, as you might expect, in the surgical group than uh, in the talc group, but in fact, um, there, were no, there was no difference between the two groups in what we call serious adverse events. So, uh, to finish with, the take-home message is that although there's no difference in survival between the two groups, we feel that the improvement in the secondary endpoints around symptom control, and particularly in the quality of life, now raises the question about whether patients with malignant mesothelioma should be considered and offered for this type of keyhole surgery in the future. I'll be presenting the full data um, at the plenary session tomorrow morning at 8.15. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, presentation, uh, we'll look at both radiation and uh, an experimental drug. And uh, this is the intergroup randomized phase three comparison, RTOG 0617. Some of the radiation data have been previously published. It's totally new uh, results with the experimental drug uh, in the study, and it'll be presented by Dr. Masters uh, from Delaware. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Bunn. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, present for the Radiation Therapy Oncology Group. Um, our study was uh, an intergroup randomized phase three comparison of standard dose versus high dose chemoradiotherapy with or without cetuximab for unresectable stage three non small cell lung cancer. I'll be presenting results on the cetuximab effect from this study, RTOG 0617. As background, uh, when RTOG 0617 was designed nearly 10 years ago, the standard of care for unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer was a combination of chemotherapy and radiation, employing a radiation dose of approximately 60 gray. Retrospective analysis and conventional wisdom suggested that escalating the dose of radiation may help improve outcome. Phase one and phase two trials from RTOG other cooperative groups and individual institutions showed that radiation doses as high as 74 gray could be delivered safely with chemotherapy. These studies suggested an improvement in both local and regional control and potentially overall survival. Based on this information, RTOG designed this trial to compare standard dose radiation with high dose radiation in combination with concurrent chemotherapy. We chose carboplatin and paclitaxel based on prior RTOG experience. 
Cetuximab, a monoclonal antibody to the epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR, had shown efficacy in combination with chemotherapy in stage 4 disease, and a phase 2 study, RTOG0324, suggested promising results when cetuximab was added to chemoradiation in stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer, with a 49% two-year survival and a median survival of 22.7 months. Patients were randomized to one of four groups and stratified according to radiation technique, performance status, PET staging, and histology. Patients on arm A underwent concurrent chemotherapy and radiation with a total radi radiation dose of 60 gray given over six weeks. Concurrent chemotherapy included weekly carboplatin and paclitaxel during radiation and two cycles of consolidation chemotherapy given once every three weeks at full systemic doses. Patients on arm B received concurrent chemotherapy and radiation to a total dose of 74 gray. They received the same consolidation chemotherapy. On arm C, patients were treated with standard dose radiation and concurrent chemotherapy with the addition of weekly cetuximab, which was continued through the two cycles of consolidation chemotherapy. Patients on arm D received high dose radiation and concurrent chemotherapy with cetuximab. I'm going to present the results of the cetuximab randomization. Overall survival of patients randomized to cetuximab with chemotherapy and radiation versus chemoradiation alone is demonstrated on this slide. There is no difference in overall survival based on cetuximab. The hazard ratio is 0 0.99. Median overall survival was 23.1 months in patients receiving cetuximab and 23.5 months in those who got chemoradiation alone. In conclusion, cetuximab did not improve overall survival or progression-free survival in this population of stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer patients when added to chemoradiotherapy. Cetuximab, however, did significantly increase grade 3 to 5 toxicities when compared to chemoradiation alone. As presented by Dr. Jeff Bradley at this year's ASCO meeting, high-dose radiation is not superior to standard-dose radiation in this group of patients with unresectable stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer. Patients receiving higher dose radiation had an increased risk of death, an increased risk of local failure, and increased toxicity when compared to standard dose radiation with chemotherapy. Thank you for your attention. last presentation uh, in this group is a phase one dose escalation trial of a new ALK inhibitor uh, to be presented by uh, Suresh Gedgil from uh, Wayne State in uh, Detroit. Uh, ALK is a oncogene that was uh, reported to be activated in lung cancer in 2007. Uh, an oral agent called crizotinib was approved four years later in 2011, uh, a record for a drug approval, uh, but this is a, a new generation of ALK inhibitors. Thank you, Dr. Bunn, um, and thank you for giving that introduction because it helps me to shorten my presentation. Um, so I'm going to be presenting the results of a phase one study evaluating electinib or R0542-4802 in ALK-positive non-small cell lung cancer patients whose cancer has progressed on crizotinib. As Dr. B Bunn mentioned, ALK gene rearrangements are the driver genetic alteration in about 5% of non-small cell lung cancer patients. And in these patients, crizotinib is approved because of a response rate of 60% and a median progression-free survival of about 10 months. But however, patients do eventually progress, and one of an important area of progression are brain metastases, so there's a need to look at other drugs in these patients. Electinib is a second generation ALK-specific uh, inhibitor, and in uh, preclinical studies has shown superior activity to crizotinib, as well as more sustained or more thorough inhibition of ALK as compared to crizotinib. Based on these data, as well as on data suggesting that it is active in ALK mutations, an important mechanism of resistance to crizotinib, 
the current phase one study was initiated, a total of 47 patients at five US sites were enrolled. Um, and looking at the toxicity data, which was the primary endpoint of the study, uh, the drug was quite well tolerated. The main symptomatic side effects were fatigue, myalgias, and edema. Most of these toxicities were grade one, um, and these were seen at higher doses. Based on the toxicity profile, pharmacokinetics, as well as efficacy, the 600 milligram twice daily dose has been determined to be the recommended phase two dose. And most of these toxicities were seen at the higher doses of 750 and 900 milligrams BID. Grade three toxicities, grade three, four toxicities were fairly uncommon. Uh, and the only three toxicities that were felt to be drug related were increase in gamma GT, a decrease in neutrophils, and hypophosphatemia. Most of the other grade three, four events were not felt to be drug related. Uh, looking at uh, these, this is the waterfall plot demonstrating the efficacy in all 47 patients. Uh, the overall response rate was about 54.5%, but at doses of 460 milligrams twice daily and higher, uh, the response rate was 60%. Uh, the bottom uh, figure represents the bar graphs of the duration on the drug of these patients, and the minimum duration in 24 of the 40. 47 patients was 120 days or longer. Uh, an important area of progression, site of progression rather, in crisotinib treated patients is brain metastases as well as leptomeningeal metastases due to the inability of crisotinib to cross the blood brain barrier. And in this study, we have observed uh, responses in brain metastases. And this actually are scans of a patient of mine that shows leptomeningeal metastases. And as, I can, as can be seen, six weeks after electinib treatment, there was almost complete clearing of the leptomeningeal metastases observed on the scans. I have to say that this patient did not get a spinal tap to confirm pathologically that these were leptomeningeal diseases, but at two different independent radiologists felt that these changes represented leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. So in summary, uh, electinib is a highly selective ALK inhibitor with significant clinical activity in ALK-positive non-small cell lung cancer patients previously treated with crizotinib. Uh, the overall response rate is 54.5%, and the drug has shown activity in CNS metastases. The drug appears to be well-tolerated. Uh, 600 milligram twice daily dose has been determined to be the recommended phase two dose. The drug has recently received breakthrough designation by the United States FDA, and there is a global phase two study evaluating the drug in crisotinib refractory patients uh, that has just been activated. Thank you very much. So I think we'll uh, go uh, presentation by presentation since they're quite different. Uh, and so we could begin uh, by asking for questions of Dr. Zhao in her presentation of uh, pemetrexid versus uh, gefitinib in the in, uh, Chinese population. So uh, in the back, yeah, use the microphone. I didn't quite understand about the um EGFR mutation status. So the patients that were in your study were EGFR mutation negative, but then you did another test further on using arms, and some of them were found to have mutations. Is that right? So if you do direct sequencing, which was the original way of uh, looking for mutations, uh, there's a sensitivity of about 20%. What that means is that um, if you have uh, two cells uh, in 10, uh, you may or may not find that. If you have one cell in 10, you're probably not going to find it. The ARMS test and most of the tests that are approved as companion diagnostics will find one in 100. So in their original part of the study, it was based on direct sequencing. And then when they came back and did the more sensitive test, they found some patients that were positive by the ARMS test that were negative by the less sensitive direct sequencing. 
And those uh, patients did appear to have benefit from the gefitinib compared to chemotherapy, whereas the patients that were truly without an EGFR mutation did not seem to have any benefit from the gefitinib. But then the question becomes, uh, she alluded to the fact that abundance might matter and that people that have a high abundance, that is 80% of the tumor cells, for example, having an EGFR mutation, would they have more benefit from gefitinib than the people who have a, a low abundance? And so maybe you can give us your ideas about whether there is a difference and whether we should be looking to see whether low abundance patients don't do as well. Thank you so much for Professor Brown. Very clear explanation <laughs> instead of me. <laughs> so Professor Brown is very familiar with this uh, clinical trial result. So just as Professor Brown said, the, the difference between uh, arms and the direct sequencing just the bec uh, because arms has more sensitive is more sensitive than direct sequencing. In direct sequencing, we can find uh, maybe uh, around 10 to 20 percent, but the arms sensitivity is uh, about one percent. So just because the uh, sensitivity difference, uh, if a tumor contains low abundance EGFR mutation, maybe the, the this EGFR mutation can be found by arms, but maybe cannot be found by direct sequencing. This is the the core reason for this difference. So. Uh, I just said we did a similar research uh, two years ago and published in JCO ju just to focus on the abundance of EGFR mutation. We found if a, pa if a tumor contains uh, EGFR mutation can tested by both direct sequencing and by arms, the abundance is high. We consider it high. And th this population can get more benefit from EGRTK treatment. But if the abundance is low, the benefit is also less than high abundance. And if the patient contains wild type confirmed by both sequencing and by, by arms, that's a true wild type, we, we think so. Yes, Dr. Hirsch. So I think, uh, I think this is uh, interesting data, and um, I think we will see more and more of this type of data as more sensitive uh, technology are uh, used in, in, in the studies. But um, I also think that uh, the paradigm of uh, splitting patients into EGFR mutation uh, group and EGFR wild type group will go out of date uh, very soon because we know that uh, EGFR wild type group is very heterogeneous in terms of other molecular subtypes where there are today uh, pot a potential, not only potential, we know there are as a targeted groups. So um, will you in the future look into this wild type uh, group and see if there are other yeah. molecular um, uh, targetable uh, abnormalities? Yes, yeah, thank you, Professor Hirsch. I think this, you, you just uh, suggest a very good uh, idea that mean, you mean uh, in wild type patient, maybe they have other dr driver gene. So it's very important for us to test the other driver gene, especially in EGF wild type population. But up to now, if, if we cannot find uh, other the specific driver gene, it, it's very important for us to give this population chemotherapy, I think. So in our study, we can see for this population now, especially in non squamous non sponsored lung cancer, if we cannot find other driver gene, it's, it, Pimetrexa is a good choice. So moving on to mesothelioma, does anyone uh, have a question for Dr. Rintoul about the uh, pleurectomy versus uh, talc pleurodesis? Robert, you, one would expect that any benefit accruing in the partial pleurectomy cases would be related to a superior pleurodesis with less recurrence of the effusion over time and therefore less dyspnea. Is that how the quality of life data stacks up? Is that the domain in which quality of life was improved? So when we looked at it um, across uh, with various other, um, with some of the EORTC quality of life tools, there um, were no, uh, there's probably a, 
collection of a number of small um, advantages, as it were. Uh, yes, when I first saw the data, I suspected, as you've just said, that it was predominantly related to plural effusion control, but it seems, there seems, it seems to be more than that, and it may uh, also be related to, the, the, in effect, the slightly reductive debulking of the tumor. Uh, and, and I think that look, going forward in the future, where do we take this? I think that's something we need to look at. But I think it, it's more to it than just um, control of pleural effusion. Was the pleurodesis done by VATS or by chest tube, and did it matter? So um, because the study lasted nearly 10 years, there was a change in practice, as we've all seen, from chest tube with talc slurry to thoracoscopic talc poudrage. And actually, um, in the first half of the study, um, more patients had talc slurry, and in the second half, more had poudrage. Um, in fact, when we've looked at those two groups, um, there doesn't seem to be a, any great difference. And that's being borne out by some other studies where actually there doesn't seem to be uh, any greater, really greater control of pleural effusion um, with poudrage than with, a, with talc slurry. Um, so that, that wasn't borne out, actually. Last question, Dr. Jett. What was the average um, operative time on the pleurectomies, and what was the average hospital days uh, on the pleurectomy arm? So the uh, number of hospitals the, for the hospital stay from admission to discharge was a uh, median of eight days in the pleurectomy group and six days in the talc group. Um, the uh, length of surgery uh, was ranged between um, about uh, 60 minutes to uh, 180 minutes, um, dependent on the surgeon and dependent on the center. Uh, but also, one of the things we've probably seen is a learning curve um, during the time, because um, although we had about 10 centers on board, uh, the first half of the study was predominantly one center in Cambridge, and then we broadened it out to multiple centers in order to increase recruitment, uh, and also because I wanted to uh, extrapolate it so that at the end of the day, um, it was a real-world study um, with, and was more easily, could more easily be applied to, to real life. So. One of the things we found, although I've not shown it here, and I'm not presenting it tomorrow, uh, we've also looked at, um, done quite a detailed health economic analysis. And what we found is that as in the second half of the study, the uh, costs come down quite markedly. And that's probably because uh, the surgeons um, have got up their learning curve and uh, perioperative care um, has, is slicker, and also because of the changes around uh, thoracoscopy. Um, so uh, it, it, we see this quite commonly with a number of studies. So the health economists have uh, done the, what they call second half analysis in a study, which uh, is a fairly well recognized um, analysis on a, on a study which lasts a long time. So turning to Dr. Masters, for those uh, that don't know, cetuximab is the drug uh, that sent Martha Stewart to jail for insider uh, trading. Uh, it is designed to attack the EGFR, but not the mutant EGFR, the wild-type uh, EGFR. So um, yeah, there are questions uh, for Dr. Masters, Dr. Hirsch. So uh, uh, for advanced lung cancer, uh, this type of targeted drugs uh, are, uh, when they are effective, they are effective in uh, well-defined subgroups based on biomarkers. And uh, do you think uh, when we combine those drugs with uh, radiotherapy, do you think uh, they will work in unselected population, which doesn't look like that in your study, and uh, that certainly brings me to, to uh, when, when will we see uh, subgroup analysis here? Was it a um, co-primary endpoint using the protein expression H score uh, or? Okay, um, obviously uh, 
you're quite an authority on this, and so it's going to be difficult for me to speak to this. But I will do my best based on uh, this study. Um, we did uh, look at H-score, which is a way of uh, establishing um, EGFR uh, overexpression using immunohistochemistry with a weighted score based on uh, the percent of cells uh, scoring 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus. I will present some data on that um, tomorrow. Um, so so there, is, uh, 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 there is some additional thought on that because obviously when a study is negative and you have a drug that does have activity, it, certainly in some diseases and um, many would say in some subsets of lung cancer, we, want, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So is there a group of patients that could potentially benefit? Um, I will show some data that says potentially there's a group that will have more of a benefit than others. The, I think the big question, and uh, going back to uh, you know, some of the discussion this morning about how we focus our efforts, uh, I think that's the big societal question, is how much um, effort are we going to spend looking at uh, subgroups where uh, we don't know whether there's a benefit, and it may require another prospective randomized study to determine that. And I think we'll have to look at the data uh, more carefully. So. Um, you're correct in pointing out that we had a, a non-selected patient population. That's a, a flaw of this study, um, but it was, uh, you know, where we were at the time the study was designed, and that uh, potentially uh, we can look at subgroups with uh, some of that uh, further analysis of, of H-score by uh, IHC. Uh, just I'll ask one quick question of Dr. Gadil, and then we need to move on. What's next? Um, the next plan that I know of uh, is that they are going to do a phase two study, a global phase two study in patients who are uh, crisotinib refractory, ALK positive, non-sponsored lung cancer, or crisotinib refractory, to confirm the results of the phase one study at the 600 milligram BID dose. Beyond that, I'm not aware of what the exact plan. Single arm. Great, thanks. Well, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for coming. We're going to conclude the press conference at this time. As you can see, we tried to really focus on a couple of themes with the screening and prevention, and then a small subset of all of the treatment uh, updates that are being presented at the conference today. All of the speakers will stay back if you wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one time to ask some questions, and uh, obviously uh, the ISLC committee will be around if people have uh, other questions of us. So thank you very much for coming.